Hello and welcome back to another episode of Colour With Me, where I, the Black Gallerina, talk about decolonial theory, curatorial practice and contemporary art galleries while colouring away. In this video, I'll be talking about the ways in which coloniality manifests within contemporary art and culture in Britain. In the background, I'll be colouring an image inspired by a historical figure called Princess Inigaldi Nana. Inigaldi Nana was a Babylonian princess who lived in 554 BCE and she also served as a high priestess and was known as the Priestess of Sin. Sin was a god of the moon in many Mesopotamian religions and what's most relevant to this video was that she was also famous for being the curator of the world's first private museum. As always, you can find out more information about the art materials in the description box of the video. With all that said, let's get colouring. Coloniality is a concept which was coined by the Peruvian sociologist Anibal Quijano to describe what is understood to be the legacies of colonialism and structures of power and control, as well as systems of knowledge. The colonial matrix of power emphasises that many institutional, social and cultural power relations today can be traced back to structures and cultures implemented during the colonial period. Coloniality is also sometimes referred to as the coloniality of power or the colonial matrix of power. During the era of the British Empire, national galleries and art museums played a key role in the promotion and maintenance of colonial narratives. These grand institutions displayed artefacts that represented Britain's imperial power and ruling class culture to the general public. In these spaces, the role of the exhibition curator involved the acquisition, administration and interpretation of valuable art that would go into these exhibitions. Over time, the role of the curator developed beyond the museum and heritage sector. The emergence of modern and contemporary galleries brought forth new modes of curating that at a glance seemed dissociated from the more traditional museum aesthetics and colonial narratives. However, it's possible to argue that many public contemporary galleries and cultural institutions are structured in ways that centre the cultural contributions of white and middle class privileged people while marginalising people of colour. In regards to my research, I don't think it's possible to produce a complete analysis of curatorial practices within these institutions without a discussion about issues relating to state-funded art. Several of the most recent interventions by the UK government in the cultural and educational sectors have highlighted the ways in which coloniality is embedded in national, historical and contemporary cultural production. The first thing I want to talk about is the COVID-19 Culture Recovery Fund. So since the beginning of the COVID-19 lockdown, many cultural institutions across the UK have experienced major redundancies and the threat of permanent closure. In response, the UK government's Department for Digital Culture, Media and Sport, aka DCMS, eventually launched their Here for Culture campaign. And as part of that campaign, they set up a 1.57 billion culture recovery fund, which aimed to provide the culture sector with funding through loans, which would assist them until spring 2021. As part of this project, Arts Council England distributed around a third of that fund to cultural organisations. However, this was way too little and too late for places which had already been unable to stay afloat while their doors remained closed. Hundreds of organisations were unsuccessful with their applications and unable to appeal the decision, including small cultural organisations in underprivileged communities with little chance of survival. In addition, the way in which the funding was administered partly prevented organisations uniting and speaking out against the unfairness of the situation. In order to secure funding, successful organisations were mandated to make public statements praising the government scheme. The fine print included the following text. In receiving this funding, you are agreeing to acknowledge this funding publicly by crediting the government's culture recovery fund. This is a challenging time for the culture sector. 
and the Here for Culture campaign aims to build a positive movement uniting the members of the public and people across the sector to voice their support for culture. Alongside this, we require you to alert your local media outlets for the news. Now, if you were on Twitter at this time and followed a load of art organisations, you would have seen the chaos that emerged as organisation after organisation posted this sort of copy and paste statement like a government propaganda machine. The next thing I want to talk about is Festival UK 2022. This was another one of the responses to the crisis in the culture sector by the government. This involves the announcement of a 120 million budget celebration titled Festival UK 2022, which some of you might know as the Brexit Festival. On the event's website, it said that the festival would be 10 open, original, optimistic, large-scale and extraordinary acts of public engagement that will showcase the UK's creativity and innovation to the world. When the festival was first announced in late 2020, many people, including myself, thought that a celebration with such a large budget being announced during a period where artists and cultural organisations were struggling to survive seemed a bit bizarre. While the organisers of Festival UK 2022 attempted to disassociate their brand from the commotion of Brexit, the first plans for the festival were originally announced by Theresa May in 2018, with the plan to happen after the exit of the EU was finalised. The festival aroused questions about the definition of UK curativity within a society tainted by Brexit and the hostile environment. To me, it looked like this project was working to preoccupy the culture sector with fighting over a pot of funding that they could only use to develop work according to an agenda and outline created by the government. One group of cultural workers which have highlighted these issues, which I also mentioned in my previous video on the hostile environment, was Migrants of Culture. Migrants of Culture is a network of migrants organising to create the conditions of safety, agency and solidarity in the culture sector for migrants, people of colour and all who are impacted by the UK's immigration regime. On their website they stated in response to the festival, we do not need a festival claiming to bring people together while the government's hostile environment forces people apart. A large scale festival and a temporary public art project can't be unconstrained by the structural inequalities amplified by political decisions. We call on cultural leaders to address the cognitive dissonance within the sector and to stop invoking the power of art to justify the latest example of new conservatism. The third thing I want to talk about is another awkward government intervention that happened in late 2020 when the DCMS Secretary of State Oliver Dowden wrote to arm's length bodies to outline the government's position on contested heritage. In the letter, there was a warning that organisations could risk losing funding if they failed to support the government's position and if they took actions which were motivated by activism or politics. The activism and politics that they're referring to is anti-racist and decoding activism which is something which has been growing in popularity over the last few years and bolstered by the Black Lives Matter summer protests. Members of Parliament like Oliver Dowden and Michelle Donnellan, Minister of State for Universities, have been working hard to paint decoding activities within cultural and educational institutions as projects of oppression that aim to distort British history in a way that promotes an unfair and unjust representation of Britain. However, this particular description of decolonisation that they use actually better fits the definition of cultural colonialism. As Frantz Fanon wrote, colonialism is not simply content to impose its rule upon the present and future of a dominated country. Colonialism is not satisfied merely with holding a people in its grip and emptying the native's brain from all content. 
by a kind of perverse logic, it turns the past of oppressed people and distorts it, disfigures it and destroys it. The aims of decolonial work that's being done in UK cultural and educational institutions involve undoing the oppressive legacies of colonialism by uncovering knowledge and cultural practices which have been actively suppressed in order to promote a positive image of Great Britain. I think it's unlikely that members of the UK government lack access to educational resources that would allow them to understand what decolonisation is. Therefore, one can only assume that they are purposely misusing their platforms to misinterpret, undermine and underfund any activities that present a challenge to British imperial narratives, culture and power. I don't think it makes sense for me to study decolonial curatorial practices without recognising how institutional practices within galleries are impacted when public funding is tainted by government-led art washing agendas. My research goes beyond the analysis of exhibition spaces and asks bigger questions such as to what extent are curatorial processes in public galleries influenced by the need to please funders? funders who will not hesitate to remind galleries that their support is dependent on galleries being politically compliant. And what happens when the agenda of the funding bodies involves throwing people of colour and people who are against their agenda under the bus in order to support a particular image of British culture? I personally do not believe that we can tackle institutional racism in contemporary art spaces without deconstructing and undermining the structures of power and control that sustain whiteness in mainstream art, education and culture. That means talking about the pervasiveness of coloniality in art and culture, whether the state, the elite or whoever feels uncomfortable hearing about structural whiteness, likes it or not. Well, that's it for this episode of Colour Me. I hope that you found it interesting. Thank you for watching. Take care and see you soon.